John chapter 17, 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. John, the disciple who Jesus loved. I can't repeat that often enough because I just think that is a great nomenclature for anybody to be the disciple that Jesus loved. Guess what? We are all the disciples Jesus loved. Praise God for that. So what we're going to do today is look at chapter 17. Now, what is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer, you know, the, the uh, Pater Nostra, the Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, you know that prayer? Uh, I don't think that's the Lord's Prayer. It's known as the Lord's Prayer. Throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, it's been called the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer. Because in the Sermon of the Mount, the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? And Jesus said, pray in this manner. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc., etc." So I think that's the disciples' prayer. What we're going to look at in chapter 17, I believe, is truly the Lord's prayer. We'll see that this is the prayer that Jesus is offering to the Father. Jesus, it's his prayer. John is recording what truly is the Lord praying. It's the Son communicating with the Father. Now we know that Jesus prayed to the Father frequently. We've seen that throughout our study here of this book. But we don't necessarily know the content of those prayers very deeply. We sort of have a general idea, but we don't know the content. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, but this prayer, the prayer that's recorded in chapter 17, reveals the content. It reveals Jesus' heart, what he wants to put before the th throne of the Father. And there are certain elements in this prayer that we'll see as we go through this. I came up with six of them. First of all, that Jesus... <clears throat> wants to be and is obedient to the Father. And he's, he's, he's speaking to that issue in this prayer. And that the Father would be glorified through the obedience of the Son. In, in Jesus' obedience all the way to the cross. And then there's a revelation that, of God in Jesus, that they are one. And he's praying to that specific issue. And he prays about choosing the disciples out of the world, choosing people to be in his fold. This might be a little controversial because we're going to be speaking of, I'm going to be speaking of predestination and election when we get to that part. And then he, then he prays about the disciples having unity just as the Father and the Son have unity, just as the Father and the Son model unity, he's praying that the disciples will have that as well. And then lastly, that the, about the believer's ultimate end, what they're, what they're to expect and what they're going to enjoy, what we're going to enjoy. Now this uh, chapter is sort of a transitional chapter because at this point, Jesus ends his earthly ministry. He no longer is ministering to people, to his disciples. He's not training them anymore, specifically, but he, he ends it. And he begins this intercessory ministry, where he is the intercessor. He is coming before the Father for us. And we see that in Hebrews uh, 7.25, where it says, Therefore he meaning Jesus, is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always leads to intercede for them. So this is where Jesus now becomes a, an active intercessor for us. So as we get into the scripture itself, we see in verses 1 through 5 that Jesus is praying for himself. He's going to be praying in three general areas. He's going to be praying for himself. He's going to be praying for his disciples. 
and he's going to be praying for all believers through all time. Verses 1 through 5, he's praying for us himself. And it says, after Jesus said this, and he was talking earlier, speaking earlier, in this long, remember, this long soliloquy that he is uh, narrated here in, in chapter 17, Jesus said after this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. So Jesus is recognizing and acknowledging that the hour of his death is nigh. In fact, it's going to happen six, nine hours from the very time that he's offering up this prayer. And he's asking that his death will glorify the Son. And, and how, could that be, how could that glorify him? Well, we see in our own lives, because after his death, he receives adoration and worship and love. And that's what the, those of us whose sin he bore on the cross offer to him, glorifying him. And he sees that. And, and in, in verse 1 here, he's accepting this charge. He's accepting the fact that the hour is nigh. He's accepting the fact that he's going to bear the sins of the world. And he does that knowing that he would be exalted to the Father. So in summary, there's a lot in this first verse. In summary, the Father is glorified because Jesus is fulfilling the redemptive plan, the plan that was set forth before the foundation of the world. The Father is glorified as is the Son. Now in verse 2 it says, For you granted him, that being Jesus, authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. So Jesus has been given all of mankind by the Father. Jesus has that in his possession. He is in charge of all mankind. And here's my strong case for predestination and election. It says the people that we have been given to him. Now we have been given to him before we were even born, right? Before the creation of the world. So I think that's a very strong case for predestination. And an election. And then in verses 3 and 4 it says, To what end? And at that end is now that now this is eternal life, that, ye, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And that work was to die on the cross, redeeming us, bearing the sins of the world, so that we might have eternal salvation. Amen? Amen. And then in verse 5, Jesus is looking past the cross. Up until verse 5, he's looking to the cross. The hour is nigh. He's accepting that. He's going to fulfill the work that God the Father has uh, given him to do. But in verse 5, he's looking past the cross. He sees the victory. And he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you, before the world began. So Jesus is looking past the cross. He's looking to resume that shared glory with the Father before the world began. Pretty, pretty poignant words. Pretty strong picture that's being presented to us. One that we can not only embrace, but have great confidence in. And then in verses 6 and 7, it says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. Once again, the believers were given to Jesus by the Father. That doesn't mean we don't have responsibility, but we were set up for that possibility. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. So again, the emphasis is on people belonging to God before their conversion even, through God's election, before the foundation of the world. Then I'll call your attention to Ephesians 
uh, 1.4, where it says, For he chose us in him before the creation of, world, of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Before the foundation of the world. Can you imagine that? That we were known before the foundation of the world and chosen to be part of his kingdom, given the opportunity to make that decision. And further in Revelation, we see where it says, and 17.8, it says, hold on. Oh, the beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet to come. Names were written in the book of life. Some were not, some were. But from the foundation of the world, you and I were chosen to be part of his kingdom. Again, I just say praise God. I don't know how we managed to pull that off, but <laughs> I'm sure glad we did, right? And then lastly, in Acts 18.10, uh, just to further illuminate that, it says, uh, For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. Jesus has us, has our back. He has us as part of his cadre, if you will, a part of his kingdom. Then in verses uh, uh, 7, 8, and 9, he goes on to say, uh, now, you have to excuse me. I'll just stop right here. My wife, who's not here, and I are watching our two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> this kid is unbelievable. Her mother's Ukrainian, so she's learning Russian. Her father's American, so she's in learning English. And the housekeeper is Spanish, so she's learning Spanish. <laughs> the kid is nonstop chatter from the moment she wakes up to the time she goes to bed, which is way too late, by the way. <laughs> and besides that, she's just constant motion all day long, just going around the... So if I fall asleep up here, or if I lose my place, you'll understand, okay? Jane is home with the kid right now because, uh, it, but it's a great joy, as you know. It, it, it's just hilarious to be with her. Okay, so back to scripture. Verses uh, uh, eight, nine, and, uh, no, excuse me. <laughs> uh, yeah, eight, nine, and ten. Okay. Um, no, no, no. Four, I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. That's being the disciples, they and us. And they knew certainly, with certainty, that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you gave me who are yours. Again, specific people set aside, sanctified to be part of this kingdom. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them affirming this genuine faith in the believers. And then in verse 11, he moves into the present tense. He, he was looking beyond the cross earlier. Now he's, look, he's speaking in the present tense. And it says, I will remain in the world no longer. This is going to happen now. But they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. So he's not looking to the future anymore. He's saying, this is going to happen. This is, this is imminent. It's going to happen right now. And Jesus is absolutely certain that these events are going to unfold. And he's praying for the disciples because he knows that they face the world's hatred and temptation, and he's going to be leaving the world. Now, the, of course, the Holy Spirit, the helper, is going to come to, to, to be our help, but he himself is going to be gone. And he's praying, though, this very important thing that the church, unfortunately, has failed at sometimes, 
but sometimes done wonderfully, and that is for unity. He's praying that we model, that the believers model, that the disciples model the unity that the Father and the Son have, which is perfect unity, right? He's praying that that will happen. Now in verses 12 through 14, Jesus again is praying for the disciples, and he's praying in lieu of, in, in face of everything that they're going to be uh, burdened with, he's pray, praying that they'll be kept safe. And he says, while I was with them, I protected them and kept, kept them safe by that name you gave me. Jesus was here. Jesus was on earth, protecting his disciples. Now he's leaving. None has been lost except one. Who is the one? Judas Iscariot, right? The son of perdition. What does perdition mean? I had to look it up because I use it a lot. I don't know what it meant. Perdition means a permanent state of punishment and damnation. That's what Jesus had to face. And it says, except the one doomed to destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. And what scripture are we talking about? Well, we've looked at it before. It's Psalm 41, where it says, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. Fulfilling scripture. Now, of course, Judas wasn't lost because anything Jesus did or didn't do. He was lost because that was predestined. It was to fulfill scripture. And then he goes on in 15 and 16, and he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, that is the disciples. Don't protect them by removing them from the situation. Keep them in the fight, right? I'm going to have the, the Holy Spirit, which is going to come in 40 days at Pentecost to help them. It's not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So there are evil forces, for sure, being characterized here, right? Being, being uh, uh, shown to be really uh, specific. And we know that also by uh, 1 Peter, one of my uh, favorite verses, actually. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around seeking whom he may destroy, whom he may devour, like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's, that's, what, that's what we have in that we're facing, right? And Jesus is warning that, but he also is giving us the, the Holy Spirit, the helper, to keep us uh, on the right track and to be, avoid Satan's arrows. And then in verse 17 and 18, it says, sanctify them by the truth. The word is truth. Truth. The word is truth. Sanctify. What does sanctify mean? To be set aside. Set the disciples aside. Make them special. Make them special in the word. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Set aside, given the truth, in the world, for what purpose? To spread the word. To be evangelical, to be evangelist, to let other people know the power and truth in Jesus Christ. This is, Jesus is pre, presupposing the writing of Scripture. The truth is going to be spread throughout the world. He's presupposing that at some point, some guy, some German guy is going to invent a printing press that's going to be at a spread the gospel throughout the world. He knows this is going to happen. Before it happened with a printing press, it happened by word of mouth for, for 1,400 years. But he's saying, set aside, given the truth, spread the truth. Three steps. And then in 19 and 20, he goes on with this theme, and he says, for them I sanctify, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified, set aside, set apart, just as Jesus was. And here's the interesting thing, the one that should give us all a thrill. My prayer is not for them alone, speaking of the disciples, I pray also for those who will believe 
and me through their message. Given the truth, spreading the truth, and he's praying for us after we receive the truth. Not the disciples, but those that are the, uh, the children of disciples, if you will. The people that, from the disciples, get to know the truth and get to act on it and get to enjoy eternal life. Then in verse 21 it says, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. So it's this unity that's united in a common belief in truth, truth, truth. Over and over John speaks of truth. Jesus speaks of truth because that's what's so important. In this world, we don't know what truth is. Truth is variable, right? The truth is what your reality is today, but that's not truth. Truth is absolute, and it's absolutely in our scripture. And it becomes even more of a reality when the Holy Spirit comes in Pentecost. And the result is that we're going to, he's praying that there will be one body sharing in his life, in Jesus' life, understanding who he was, what he was teaching, and what he did for us, his instruction and his commands for us and how to live. That is being, that's unity. Then in verse 22, it says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. So look at that. He gave, I have given them the glory that you have given me. We as believers have access to the, ass the essence of the Godhead, of God himself, through the Holy Spirit. That's, that's an amazing concept, that we actually have God living in us. That's what Jesus is teaching here. And in verse 23 it says, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. All brought together around the truth that saves. Corinthians 12, just as one body, though one, uh, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Unity, unity in the spirit. That's what Jesus is praying for in the Lord's Prayer. By the way, I'm going to keep telling you, this is the Lord's Prayer. And then in verse 24, it says, Father, don't you just love the intimacy that Jesus expresses here? Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Where is Jesus going? heaven. Where is he asking that the believers will go to be with him? Heaven. And what are we going to be able to do in heaven? Participate in his glory. This is what he's laying out for us. This is, this is our heritage. This is our future. And praise God for that. And then in verses 25 and 26, there's a further summary of this uh, of this uh, prayer, and it says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made, no, made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and I myself may be in them. So this is a summary of the prayer that Jesus is offering before the Father in verse 17. It promises a continuing indwelling of the Holy Spirit and a continuity of Jesus' love for us and our love for him. This is the Lord's Prayer. This is what the Lord offered to the Father. And he's, and he's interceding for us as believers as we pray to him that we might propagate the truth, that we might have peace, and that we might have confidence in our eternal salvation. 
Amen? Amen. Let's sing. All oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the Lord. 